Hi, I'm Mark Hutter. I work at a company called Landing. We're trying to reinvent the way people think about apartment living and leasing. And I'm here to talk through the logistics today of the following question. Can active storage serve images for the modern web? Well, as it turns out, the answer to that is not so easy. So what are we really talking about here? Well, we're talking about speed. We're talking about fast. So what is fast? How do we, how do we define it? Lightning. Boom. Done. Any questions? That's not right. That's not right. For the purposes here, we're talking about if active storage can handle the speed requirements of serving images, can it live up to the modern web browsers and what they deem as fast? So what is fast? It's a good question. Fast is one of these amorphous things. We all kind of know what it looks like when we see it. We've all been to those sites where they say, where you say, wow, that was fast. But putting actual metrics or numbers to it can sometimes be tricky and we can kind of drive ourselves into a ditch. We can focus on the wrong things or we can become consumed with particular aspects of performance with neglecting others. To get a holistic view of this performance situation is complex. Especially these days, so much JavaScript, third-party additions, DNS, CDNs, acronym SALAD. But let me start off by saying, everything you already know about performance is true. I'm not here to reinvent your knowledge of Rails performance or JavaScript performance or preach some overarching one-size-fits-all solution to all your performance problems. You're already a good developer. You know what performance is. You know how to make your websites and your web apps fast. I'm not here to change that or to confuse the situation. I'm only here to discuss performance as it pertains to using active storage to serve your image assets. And performance still has some big pillars. Your server side, your JavaScript, and your images. They all need to be performing well in order for your site to be measured as something that is fast on the modern web. And I'm not going to cover anything other than how images perform using active storage as your library of choice for serving image assets. So at this point you might be thinking, why should I care? I know how to make things fast. I'm sure all my production apps are working fast enough. Did I hit play on the wrong conference talk here? This seems like a trivial thing. And you might think that. But as of November 2019, Google announced that Chrome will start identifying sites that typically load as slow. They'll start badging things to notify the end user that a site is slower than other sites on the internet. And if you needed more persuasion, there are a few users out there who use Chrome as the primary browser. You may be viewing this conference talk on Google Chrome. So what's it going to look like if they start to badge your site as slow? Well, here's some screenshots taken from the blog post. You can see they have this indicator that it's usually slow. And if you're a site that sells something, a product or a service, you probably don't want to be on this list. Okay. So how do we determine that something is fast? How do we measure this? What tools are at my disposal? How's Google figuring it out? Well, actually, there are quite a few. So, of course, Google provides a couple tools themselves. There's a page speed index, a web based tool, and then Lighthouse, which is built right into the Chrome browser. There are also some other things, and in my experience, it's better to use a wide variety of tools when measuring these things to get a more holistic view of what performance is on your site. They even have a tool specifically for images and paid as it pertains to your page weight and your image sizes. 
but for the purposes of this talk, we'll lean into the Google tools. I find a lot of business partners like to use them anyway. They're easy to read and easier to understand. So if you've ever seen these tools, and you don't know what they look like, they look like this. They have several things here. There are lists of opportunities in one section. There are lists of diagnostics in another section. And all these are great, but what we really want to focus on is this top six listing here of the measurements from the lab data. So what do these measure measurements actually mean? Well, I don't want to really go too deep on this because this is RailsConf and I want to talk about Rails and active storage and we could probably have an entirely different talk about what these measurements mean and how to affect change on each one but I'll shortcut you some documentation reading. It's important to note that not all the measurements are created equal. Some of them are weighted very differently, much higher, much lower than others. Like what's this? Zero X? So we can just throw that one out right away. And it's also important to note all over the documentation, it says opportunities and diagnostics do not directly affect your performance score. Even though they're in big red letters on the page, it's important that these are suggestions to things that might improve it, but won't directly infect, affect your performance score. For instance, it's often noted in the opportunity section that you could use next-gen formats to increase the performance of your site. However, if your rail server is running 3,800 queries, true story, your performance score will still be bad, always. There's no amount of image optimization that gets you away from that. Okay, so we probably do need to delve a little bit into what these things mean, especially as it pertains to images. So we'll look at a couple. First, Contentful Paint measures how long it takes the browser to render the first piece of DOM content. First first HTML to hit the page. You could think about this on your Rails server as if you have a lot of partials, a lot of nested partials, and they're all rendering some image, how long is it going to take your Rails server to accrue all that and render it back out and send it back across the wire? Another big one is the speed index measure of how quickly you can get visual content to start to load. So the Lighthouse tool will start to capture a vid video of as the page loads and compute visual progress. Kind of everything helps this one, honestly. Uh, but again, you can think, are my logos blocking? Are there those assets coming from active storage? Uh, are there lots of uh, partials or things that are going on on the server through active storage that could be preventing the page from getting that first visual display going. Can I defer some things to an Ajax call? Okay, so now we have some tools, we understand a little bit about the measurements, which brings us back to our original question. Can we use active storage to serve all our image assets? Well, like every single technology choice you'll ever make in your entire career, it, it all depends on what exactly your specific needs are and what your requirements are for your business or your project. However, just like all of the Rails features and modules, active storage solves a ton of problems we had. And I think it's important to highlight some of those and give you a fair and balanced view of what active storage gives you and what some of the trade-offs might be before you decide whether it will be your image serving resource. So we all remember the third-party gem way of doing this. We had solutions to this, paperclip, carrier wave, to name a few, and how did they solve this problem of attaching images to domain models? Well, they would sprinkle data attributes all across your domain models for anything that needed to have an image. So if you had a user and an, they had an avatar, there would be some data elements on the user's table to represent the data necessary to get that image. If you had a product and it had some images, same thing, data, 
data attributes sprinkled on. This worked pretty well, but it was very hard for anybody who was analyzing the data to know where to look at all times. Active Storage brought all that into one, or at rather two places, and they centralized all of your image needs into two tables, the attachments and the blobs table. Now this might not seem like such a big deal, but if you're in a bigger organization and you maybe have different facets of engineering like data engineering or data analysts that are doing analysis on things that have proper imaging, have enough images, etc. This makes it really easy for them to know where to go to look. They don't have to have intimate knowledge of your domain model. And if you haven't yet used active storage in real life, the ease of use is pretty fantastic, just like everything we use as Rails developers. There's a little configuration to get your cloud provider set up, but then the actual code to integrate it into your application is really simple and easy to understand and very comfortable as a Rails developer. There's an association onto your models to attach some amount of images, change to your strong params, pretty easy stuff, a little form update to consume the images, and then we render the images with the image tag we're all so familiar with. Again, very easy, very comfortable. There's nothing tremendous here, but isn't that sort of the beauty of it? Simple, clean method APIs into our image assets. And Active Storage out of the box is going to give you on-the-fly resizing to all of the sizes you may need of an image across your site. This is a great way to assure proper size is used every time. The developer doesn't have to have any knowledge of how the transformation happens, whether it's mini magic or image magic or some other processing gem. They don't know, need to know the methods that are used to do so. You just call dot variant and it just works. And there's some added security features that I at least have not been aware of that have been available to me with the other libraries. These are great for sharing or returning sensitive information to a client without necessarily exposing yourself to long-term permanent risk or having to manage this. So by using this dot service URL method, you get a nice URL 302 redirect to your cloud provider returned to the client with a default expiration, it's signed, it's authorized, it has all the proper security features so that you can be assured without a doubt that this link to some file attachment is non-permanent and will go away without you having to manage the situation. But maybe the most compelling reason to use active storage as a Rails developer is that it's just baked right in, which means you know you're getting the support of the Rails team that this thing is being actively maintained, that it's being actively triaged, and that people are working and thinking about this gem all the time. We've all used gems in the past, I'm sure, that have fallen out of favor, out of support, or seemingly just by the wayside, and we have to decide what to do to th with that. With active storage being a part of Rails, you know it's coming along, away, along the way in the journey for all of our web apps. So at this point, you might be thinking, you've made some compelling arguments. Why are we even having this conversation? Of course, active storage should be what I use for my image assets. Well, let's take a look at an example of what happens when the browser requests an image asset from active storage, the process it goes through. The first thing that happens is it's going to run two database queries one to the attachments table and one to the blobs table to try to find the relevant asset. These queries are good, they're well optimized, they're well written. However, you can see even in this example, kind of, we, we end up with a total of four milliseconds to get one image asset. You can think of this as if you're returning a lot of models and those models have a lot of assets, this could get out of hand very quickly, just as any n plus 1 query could, unless you're using n plus 1 as a feature of Russian doll caching or something. Then when active storage returns 
the asset to the browser, it actually returns a 302 redirect to the cloud provider. You are now subject to the network latency of whatever file storage provider you have, and this is off your web server and out of your control. I'm not a CDN expert, but I also think there may be some trouble with getting a CDN, such as CloudFront or CloudFlare, to cache the asset once seen if it's returned as a 302 redirect. We also saw the benefits of that on-the-fly variant re resizing, but it can be a very expensive process. So you can see in this example, when we call and it needs to do the variant, it runs the requisite um, active storage queries. It then, if the resize doesn't exist, it performs the transformation persists to the cloud provider and gives you back the URL in order to perform the redirect. You see in this one example, that entire process took 1.872 seconds. That's two whole seconds on the server to give you back a thumbnail image if it wasn't already there. Now this may not be a problem since it'll only happen the first time the resize is requested. After that, Active Storage will save it for you and this will happen much faster. However, if you're doing a lot of image uploading, your images are changing frequently or you're getting a lot of new images or expanding your image collection pretty often, your end user stands a decent percentage chance of running into this at least sometimes. If you're tracking your P99, P95 metrics, really closely, this could throw your metrics off pretty bad if even one user or two users get really high re response times because of this feature. You can see here in the network tab what that might look like to the end browser. And if you are an organization that cares deeply about your mobile-friendly, compressed, next-gen formats like WebP or uh, JPEG 2000, JPEG XR, how do you handle attaching those compressed formats to either the canonical or the resized variant? As far as I know, there's not an out-of-the-box solution or something very clearly defined as to hand how to handle this. However, most of this can be very easily mitigated with a few active storage best practices. So just like as we came along as Rails developers and we got better at active record and we got better at query optimization and developer practice of writing active record queries, I think some best practices are starting to emerge out of active storage, how to best use it so that it's optimized for your situations and uh, you won't run into these pitfalls. So just go ahead and process all your resizes ahead of time, when they're uploaded or when they're added to your site, if you can. This is a pretty simple way to make sure that you never run into the problem of having a resize happen in flight with the request response lifecycle. You can do this very, very easily with active storage with the dot processed method, where dot processed will do the resize for you and save it to your storage so that it'll be there when your end user, your customer requests, makes that same request. Now this depends on your situation. If your end user is uploading the image and they need it back immediately, this may not be possible. However, if you're a company and you have a catalog of products and images are uploaded with any length duration ahead of time, this becomes a trivial thing to do that will keep your response times down where you'll never see or pay penalties for inline resizing. Or better yet, process it in the background. This becomes really important if you're uploading a lot of images at once or you, if you have a lot of variant resizes. So if you are uploading 25 images at a time and those 25 images have four or five different formats, just go ahead and throw all those into a background jobs and let the background jobs plow through them in their good old time. You don't want your administrative users who are uploading these things to be sitting and waiting for all that processing to happen either. 
it takes it out of the user request off of your web server thread and puts it into a background process thread where it can be done in its own time. And we saw the problem where active storage is running two queries to get every attachment to a model. Well, remember, these are just tables. They're tables with associations, a has many. We can eager load these things, and Active Storage provides for you a handy method that will eager load all of the relevant attachments for you, thereby eliminating that uh, over, over querying the database problem. So what about my CDN? How do I get my image assets into the CDN? This one's a little trickier. So this has been talked about a great deal on GitHub issues on the Rails project. Uh, this comes directly from a GitHub issue on Rails, but there's a pretty well-published monkey patch to the representations controller show action. So what, what this does, the representations controller is what handles finding the variant resize when you call dot variant from a view. So this is overriding the behavior so that it no longer behaves in the default manner, but rather returns to you the asset looking more like it came from um, the web server itself rather than giving you the cloud provider URL in a redirect. And I've used this. This works. We use this in our production apps today. So what do I do with my compressed formats? Well, another tricky one. You're going to have to build something. Here's some samples of part of our solution. It's the data layer and the view layer. We have a compressed attachments table that associates to the active storage blobs. This is where we keep our formats, the sizes, and the URL of our, the cloud provider, in our case, S3. We then write some view helpers that look very much like image tag, where it will render back out the HTML for us. But this all depends on what your specific needs are. I wouldn't take anything I've said today and get too hung up on any one given point. For instance, if we just take in isolation the compressed formats, what are your needs for serving compressed formats? Don't walk away thinking, oh, I must be serving WebP on all of my applications. This won't work for me. A good for instance. This is the Google PageSpeed score for the Birmingham on Rails conference. It scores a 100. Perfect score on Lighthouse and Google PageSpeeds. It also is listed as opportunities to serve next-gen formats because we are doing nothing with WebP or any other compressed formats. So again, the compressed formats is not going to win you the trophy. Back to the question, can active storage be used explicitly as your image serving resource? Well, we think so. And just as an example, I spun up a scaffolded new Rails application for the purposes of ser serving very high resolution and uh, images with many variant resizes, I ran this through the performance tool, Google PageSpeed Insights, and got a 73. You might think that's not that bad, but for an empty app with little logic and no JavaScript or CSS, this is actually pretty hard to look at. And then following some of the best practices we've discussed as part of this talk, we were able to improve the score to a 99 simply by eliminating some of the areas that cause performance hiccups. Thank you. Thank you for watching this talk. Uh, thank you to my wife and my family who supported me and gave me the time and support to do this in an unprecedented time for the world. Thank you to the Rails conference organizers for putting this together so that we could still share ideas and connect as a Rails community. Uh, I'm Mark Hutter. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, please reach out if you'd like to talk more.